Hey, welcome to our third and final night of the Intentional Family Seminar. Uh, we're so excited that you chose to join us here. Uh, I just want to share a few things, and then we can get going. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that tonight, um, as we go through the the uh, kind of the lineup of what we have, we want to encourage you once again to participate. Um, so if you haven't been here the last couple weeks, or um, if you've been tracking, I just want to make it known that there's a different link for this week. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner of either of those screens, there is a link there, URL, for you to follow. If you have questions throughout the night, if you have concerns, if you have thoughts, um, if you can't hear because the microphone's not loud enough, anything, feel free um, to just go to that link and then um, you can post your questions, thoughts there. And then if somebody else puts a question that you want to hear more about, like that question. We get a lot of responses on it, then it's one that we'll put to the top of the list because tonight... Um, to conclude our, our time together, our last element that we're going to do is going to be actually a full panel up here with some of the people that you heard from last week. Pastor Steve's going to come up, and then we've got some new people that are going to join as well to just be here to continue the conversation and dialogue. So if you have questions, you'll have the opportunity to be able to ask those as well. And then one more thing, I do encourage everybody to open that, that URL because at the end of the night, we're going to post a survey, and we want to hear from you on how this went on things that you would like to, to get more in depth in in the future, different formats, that kind of thing. We want your feedback as we continue to develop this, this, this family ministry and how we can do these things together. So please, um, if anything, even if you don't participate in anything else, uh, as far as the URL is concerned, we we're asking that you would at least fill out the survey. Um, and you can, everybody can do that, not just uh, one per household. Anybody can do that um, here tonight um, or as the time goes on as well. Um, I, I just want to mention one more thing. Um, if you remember last week, the last two weeks we've tried to give away um, a membership to the Children's Museum, and the first week we were successful in doing so. Last week, uh, the Hawkett's won, but they donated it back to us. So tonight we actually have two prizes to give away, two memberships, and so here's how this is going to work. In just a moment, we're going to start a timer for five minutes. If you reach into the middle of your table, you will find a bingo card. A bingo card. Now, today's activity is going to be a little bit more interactive than the last two have been. The first week, you remember, we did a quiz to test how well you knew ridiculous statistics around the world. The second week, last week, we did a stand-up, sit-down, last man or woman standing game. This week, we're doing human bingo, and here's how this works. Don't begin yet. Don't begin. You can read through these if you want to, but... You're going to go around, and I want you, like I said before, it's a five-minute thing, so it's not going to be very long. Um, I want you to go around and, and introduce yourself to new people that you might not know. If there's some people you do know, that's fine as well. But you need to get five signatures in a row to create a bingo, okay? Does that make sense? Obviously, you've got free space, so if you use the middle, you can do so. Next but there are different things on here, like someone with, four, with more than four kids. You need somebody with more than four kids to sign that. Or someone who has has came to all three seminars, or my personal favorite, the bottom right-hand corner, a person. I will sign that for you if you would like me to. I am literally a person. I can do that. However, here's how this works. As soon as you get five in a row, whether it be uh, horizontally, vertically, or diagonal, you have to run up here and yell bingo. So I know that you won. No just kind of saying it or sitting down or whatever else. First person to finish wins. Second person to finish also wins. So I will say when one person is finished, uh, if another person goes, that's fine as well. One more thing I will say, you can only sign one card one time. So if somebody comes up to you and asks for your signature, you may do one, but you can't do any more on their card. Only one. You can't do more than one. Are we ready? Any questions? Yes, good one. Yes, it looks like it got cut off, probably from space. Thank you. If they've broken a bone, that is N number one. Thank you. The reformatting did not help us. All right, are we ready? Five minutes is going up in five, four, three, two, one, go. Okay, we have our first winner. We need to hear it, though. We were, oh, uh, hi. <laughs> oh, bingo. Bingo. Keep going for number two. Hurry up. Keep going. That was record time, 40, less than 40 seconds. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Five in a row. It's the same ones. I, I need to hear from you, too. What? 
Bingo. Bingo. They had someone with more than four kids, someone who lives outside of Brookings, free space, a grandmother, and a person, which is probably the most difficult. I'm so sorry. Good try, good try. Well done. You did do a great job. Let's hear it for Alan, everybody. And let's hear it for these ladies as well. Congratulations. I'm glad you guys didn't break a bone coming up here. Congratulations. Thank you so much for participating. That was very quick. Let me just, let me just encourage you on this. Um, if you did not find all of them or if you see some on here that are very interesting to you, maybe you homeschool your kids and you'd like to find more people that do so you can interact with them about how they do that. Maybe um, you, you, know, you, you didn't meet anybody on the panel. You'd like to talk more deeply about some of those things. I do encourage you to find people that may fit the bill here so that you can get together with others and learn about their parenting and what they do as well. I'm going to introduce um, Pastor Dave to come up, and he's going to start you in table discussion. But before he comes up, I would like to pray with you just to start. God, we thank you once again for these moments. We can come to this place, and we can learn together. We can grow together. We can encourage each other and equip each other. And I just pray that tonight, as we put all this in your hands, that we would glorify you, that we would understand better how we can steward the relationships and the influence that we have over the people that you've placed in our life. God, we thank you for these moments. We thank you for who you are and what you've done for this season of Christmas and everything that goes with it. And God, we just ask in these moments that you would be present and that we would feel that presence as we move forward. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Dave. Thank you. Oh, that game went a lot faster than we have planned, so that means we have more time for everything else. So we're actually, like Steve, we're going to flip how we do this evening a little bit. We're actually going to start with table discussions. Um, one thing that we handed out last week was our value assessment. This is something that I brought to the table um, that we, me and my intern were working on because I realized how important it is for us as a family to evaluate our core values and then ask the question, now that we know our core values, what are we going to do about this? How are we, we going to to begin to implement these as a family um, through our family discipline plan. So what I want to do now is I want to open up it to you guys. I want to give you guys 15 minutes. Hopefully you guys either brought your values or wrote them down. If you didn't, this will be a really good time to bounce ideas off of other people sitting at your table to talk about our discipleship plan and how we're going to begin intentionally implementing that with our families. Well, when we did this as a family, one of the big things that we evaluated, one of our big values was play. Uh, when I grew up, every time that I asked my dad to play with me, he was too busy to play. Um, and I, in essence, so when we did this, I, I was putting that on our family and I realized, wow, that's, that's a value that I didn't realize I was putting on our family, but it's something that I highly value. So one of the things in, the, in our morning, every time one of our kids will say, hey, daddy, can you play with me? It might be the most inconvenient time in the morning. Getting three kids in the morning in the ready within an hour is so hectic. But if he asks me, I always make it a point to say, yeah, buddy, I will. And I'll take two minutes out of my morning to do that. Um, and that's one of the things that this assessment helped me realize. And it's helping me to reinforce that with our family. No matter what time of the day it is, we try to do that in moderation. Just to show our kids that we do appreciate and we value their time. Um, and it, hopefully someday they'll be able to look back and say, you know, our parents took time out for us. Um, in the midst of our chaos, they did that. Um, so what I want to do right now is just open this back up to you guys for a little table discussion to talk about what were some of the values you guys identified and how are you going to implement those as a family. So if you look, we're at week three. I don't need that. Week three of our pamphlet. Um, and um, you guys can work through that, that uh, first page for week three that talks about discuss your family plan, how are you going to implement that, and what are some of your family core values. In my hopes in this table discussion, you can bounce off ideas from the other people at your table, hear what their values are, and how are they planning to implement that so that we can continue to refine what our values are. Um, I don't think they're going to be concrete once we decide what they are, but our hope is to make them learning so that we can continue to implement the ones that we find most important. So we're going to give you guys about a good chunk, 10, 15 minutes right now, to have this, this discussion. Um, so please make it meaningful at this time. You guys can begin your table discussion. Um, I want to make mention of one, th one thing real quick, and that is if you look in the middle of your table, you'll find a little packet um, that's, that uh, I can't remember what it says on top, but it's basically um, a write-up from Randy and Stacey Hansen. They were um, 
supposed to be here the first night of the seminar to share about parenting, strategic parenting, um, but because of weather, they were unable to make it. And so tonight, they're going to talk about that a little bit, and they wanted to put some of the things they were going to share in your hands. So I want to encourage you to, during the night, uh, maybe take a glance at it if you've got a few moments here and there between the speakers or whenever. And if there's any questions that come up from that, um, you can have those uh, ready to fire um, when, we, when we come to the panel time as well. Um, tonight, we're focusing on healthy relationships and how those impact those that we uh, come in contact with, namely our family. And so tonight, we've got two uh, short lectures, one from Pastor Steve and then one from Pastor Dave. And um, as we walk through these, uh, feel free to take plenty of notes, and there'll be time for questions on those as well. But this is an opportunity to be able to talk about our own spiritual health and how our relationship with Christ uh, impacts those around us. So please join me in welcoming Pastor Steve to the platform. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Self-care is uh, essential for you to contribute to your family in a meaningful way. You're your best gift to them when you're doing well, body, soul, and spirit. And I think it's classic for a lot of people to go at an unsustainable rate in their life, and they get to their 40s and 50s, and you see this burnout emotionally and then maybe spiritually. But I submit to you that usually before that burnout begins to uh, manifest itself in your life in those areas, frequently there's physical signs that something's not going right. And most of us ignore it. And I don't know who, who you are and how you live your life, but when I look back over my life, since I've been about uh, 12, 13 years old, I've been going 100 miles an hour and thinking that that would never affect me and just went really, really, really fast. And I had all kinds of physical signs when I look back at them. Stress uh, manifests itself oftentimes in chest pains and, you know, the inability to sleep and the and irritability and all those kind of things begin to happen. And I think a lot of us think, I can just go at this unsustainable pace. And you know what you're doing? You think you're cheating your future. And you cannot cheat your future. You will ultimately pay a price. And I remember laying on that table in a Vera Heart Hospital thinking, how did I ever get here? And I began to do a lot of reflection at that moment. And as soon as I was being discharged, they asked me three questions. How was your diet? Pretty good. At least now it is. Second, do you exercise? Yeah, a lot. Third, how is your stress management? Uh, and I remember looking at the nurse saying, uh, 45 years of a problem. And she said, yeah, we see that all the time. So what are you going to change? And I remember going back after that having some real serious talks with Pastor Aaron. He remembers that. He was super helpful in drastically changing some things in my life, not trying to work so much, being willing to give more away, um, spiritually connecting a lot more with things that fuel my soul, religiously exercising, religiously eating the right kind of diet. I hate to use that term with those two things, but stewarding myself well and just utterly changing because I realized this, I have been trying to cheat the future, thinking that my body would never give out on me. And what gave out first on me was my body. It began to say, you can't do this. And so what I have for you to take today is a quiz. This is super fast. There's a self-care quiz, sign to trouble. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read through these really fast and circle it if it applies to you. Do not rationalize it away. Do not overanalyze. As I read this, if you think I have a problem with this a bit, circle it. The idea here is to become self-aware and to cut off problems of the future. So here we go. You ready? I'm going to read through these really fast. If this applies to you, circle it. Your passion is fading, and you're doing life by sheer discipline. Some of us are really good at being disciplined and just going and putting one foot in front of the other foot. If that's what you're doing, if that's how you're doing life right now, just circle it. Don't overanalyze. You feel numb. This happened to me. This you begin to not have highs or lows. You just feel numb. You just do life. But there's not that passion. There's not that enjoyment of the high moments. And there's not that ability to kind of mourn. Everyone drains you. You go home, the kids drain you. The people at work drain you. Your neighbor drains you. Every interaction you have begins to drain you. That's a sign that something's amiss in you and you're not quite doing life right. Um, let me get to page two here. Little things make you disproportionately emotional. You know, it's the guy that gets extraordinarily mad in the checkout line 
at Walmart. I see that all the time. I just want to go and give them a hug and say, you're out of control, buddy. Because if you can't handle a Walmart line, something's amiss in your life. Or throw bread at you. Or, oh, oh, that's not a good thing. You're getting really cynical. You're beginning to just everything. You always think there's a problem. And someone might call you, and you think, now what's wrong? If that's the first response, chances are you're out of control and you're starting to burn out. You can't think straight. Your, your logic is starting to go a little skew. Most likely, your productivity is dropping at work and at home. You just don't get as much done. You find yourself staring off in space frequently, daydreaming a little bit. You don't laugh. It takes a lot to get you just to laugh. I, I know when I'm doing really well, I laugh really easily, you know? And uh, when I'm not doing really well, even the funny things I don't laugh about much. You're, you're self-medicating. I hear people say, you know, a little glass of wine is good for me to unwind at night. Are you self-medicating or what's going on? You know, if you have to numb, your, numb the edges, then that's not, that's not a solution. Sleep and time off don't rejuvenate. Usually these are signs that something is uh, 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 in trouble. If you circled like six to eight of these, you need to see somebody. I'm serious. You need to begin to take this seriously in your life because you're heading down a path that's probably not sustainable in your life. Okay? Some, some suggestions for recovery are, are really quick. I'm going super fast, probably creating more questions than I'm helping with, but that's okay. Here's a, here's a way to recovery. Tell somebody what's really going on. Somebody else beside your spouse. Tell somebody, probably if you're really, if you circle like eight to ten of these, you probably should see a counselor. Somebody who can objectively look at your life and help you to begin to reorder it right. Develop a circle of support around you. Develop three or four people or five people that you can go to and they can become trusted advisors for you. Um, lean into God. And the reason to lean into God is third on this list is you usually can't lean into God until somebody else helps you a little bit get out of your funk, okay? So the first thing should be to lean into God, but most people who are in kind of a bad place have a really difficult time doing that. Do what you can, do small things. Don't make a major decision like quitting a job or, uh, you know, moving someplace thinking that'll help you feel better. Don't do major decisions if you're feeling like this. Learn to grieve adequately. We do that very, very badly in our culture. In other words, mourn the losses in your life. Learn to, to have some funerals for some things that maybe disappointed you, that didn't work out. Acknowledge it, mourn it, get on. Um, reopen your heart then to Jesus and pray that way. And lastly, live in a way today. This is maybe the biggest point of everything I'm going to say. Live in a way today that will cause you to thrive tomorrow rather than deprive tomorrow. Amen? Live in a way today that will cause you to thrive tomorrow. You are, then you become the best gift you can be to your family. They want you around. I remember some of my kids saying to me when I was going through some of my things, Dad, take this serious. We want you to be around for the next decade. We want you to be part of our grandkids' lives, you know? Because I'm thinking, well, I know Jesus. I'll just go home if this happens. You follow? I mean, I, you really think like that sometimes. I, I don't know how you think. I think like that. Hey, to live is to serve Christ. To die is a gain. That's a misuse of that verse, by the way. Anyway, um, so... Think of Matthew 5.3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. What that means is blessed are those who know who they are. They understand their condition. They understand their brokenness. They understand what's going on in their life. Blessed are such ones because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I think as you go through this, this is a good tool. And I'm going to quit there. I, I know I'm raising more questions than I, I'm, I'm answering. But this book uh, by Kerry Newhoff, Didn't See It Coming, contains all this stuff in it. This is just a little piece from one chapter. It's really a good little read. It's $13 off Amazon. Pastor Aaron looked it up. We don't have them back here. Or, but it, it didn't see it coming. It's going to read really fast. Another one that's really good to read, if you want a little book on self-care, is Choosing to Cheat by Anne Stanley. It's a catchy little title, but it says you're going to cheat someplace in your life all the time. Choose to cheat the spots and, and make that wisely, okay? That, that least affect you adversely 
and your family. So choosing the cheat and didn't see it coming. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Dave, correct? Okay. Perfect. That was great. Uh, the thing that um, I love about what we're doing tonight is that led perfectly into where I'm going uh, tonight. And so I'm going to try to cram 10 years of what I've been learning into about 10 minutes. So hold on. I'm sorry if I talk fast, but my hope is to encourage and, and spark a conversation inside of yourself and inside of your loved ones to kind of evaluate what's really going on and who you truly are. So the two things I'm going to talk tonight about briefly are going to be our identity and evaluated experiences. And how do we begin pushing into that? I think Steve said it's such a good job of we, we, we need to take care of ourselves. You know, that, that's kind of the first key point. But the second part is, uh, who are we in the midst of this? One of the things is I, I talk to people who have kids and families and individuals that's saying, sometimes I begin to lose my identity in the midst of having a family because we just sometimes just don't have time anymore. Um, I have three little ones. It's so hard to take care of ourselves and to find carved time out for the things that are important to us. Um, so I understand the midst of that and the tension of that. Um, but what I want to say is, is diving into this is just as important as that because the way that we, we react to situations or what our family sees and if we aren't taking care of ourselves, those are going to be the things that they begin to repeat. Um, so it's important to know ourselves uh, on that front. Um, so before I kind of dive into it, um, I want to give you guys the answer. Um, before I dive into the actual question. And I love it because uh, Pastor Aaron this weekend gave everybody the answer in such a profound way that I just, I just want to repeat that. Um, so he, he spoke about his study through Psalms 1. Um, what does it look like to be rooted in Christ? And I feel like understanding that is exactly what we're trying to get at through the whole midst of this seminar is being rooted in Christ. So um, I'm going to read Psalms 1-3. Uh, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf, leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. And, and I love that by saying, who, where are you rooted in? Are you rooted by this stream of water, this, this water of life that is going to flourish the plant? Or are we rooting ourselves somewhere far away from the water that when anything comes, our leaves are going to start to wither? Um, so when, when troubles come our way, what are you relying on? What are you saying to yourself? What truths of God are you holding on to? Or what lies are you choosing to believe in? That's where I want to go tonight a little bit more. Um, so what I want to do is kind of uh, bring ourselves into the tension of um, how, do we do the, how do we do this? How do we begin um, to understanding who we are? Because I think identity is a big thing. Um, is it done by personality assessments? Um, that's kind of a, a big thing that people like to do now is just take Myers-Briggs, their strength test. Um, I just took my core team through five different assessments um, through a seven-week process because uh, I, I believe firmly in what it is, knowing ourselves. Um, but what I, what I think is amiss is we often jump on the bandwagon of uh, personality assessments, but then what do we do after that? Okay, I know that I'm an ENFJ. Cool, good for you, All right? What does, that, what does that do? So in the midst of that, my, my encouragement is we need to know our strengths and our weaknesses in the midst of who we are, and we need to know um, uh, what that looks like when we're at our best and when we're at our worst. Because if we can begin to understand ourselves just a little bit more, we can understand what that looks like in the midst of our relationships that we have. So when confrontation happens, we can catch ourselves and we can understand our red flags when we're starting to act out of our worst instead of our best for the ones that we care about. And so I, could, I can tell you this, I'm an ENFJ, but what does that truly mean? Um, I'm, I'm reliable. Um, people can trust on me. I like to show up. I like, I like to do what I say. Um, I'm tolerant. I'm a team player. I love bringing people in, um, and I'm going to be your biggest advocate if you're on my team. I got your back. Um, it also means that I can be pretty charismatic. Um, I love new ideas. Um, I love to try new things. Um, so being up here isn't intimidating to me, and I like to be able to read the people that I'm sitting across with. So if I'm in a counseling session, or if I, even if I see my wife, I can, I can usually pinpoint when she's mad or upset about something. Um, it doesn't mean that I always do the right thing in response, but I can usually tell when something's wrong. Um, but being an ENFJ also means that um, I can be overly idealistic. Um, I like to overpromise and underproduce. Um, because I think I can do a lot of things, so it can be a good thing, but then um, I'm overly idealistic, so sometimes I just, I just don't carry through with all the things that I, um, that I say that I will. And then sometimes I can be too sensitive to feedback, especially when I'm, when I'm at my worst. One comment can derail me for the rest of the day or for the rest of the week. 
But when I'm at my best, I thrive under those conditions. When I'm at my worst, I have a hard time making tough decisions, especially when it involves people. But if I'm not aware of myself to this degree, sometimes it looks like I can just be stalling or I'm not doing the things that I need to be doing. So I think for us, taking it that step further by saying, not just knowing yourself, but then how does that apply to our best and our worst? And so what I want to do is um, just start the conversation. And I think we need to become honest with ourselves about who we are and understanding how that is affected by our evaluated experiences. So I have two books that I want to uh, just read yeah. out real quickly to kind of help understand this concept a little bit more. So the first book is called Rising Strong, and she explains it this way. Uh, the goal of the rumble is to get honest about our stories we're making up about our struggles, to revisit, challenge, and reality check these narratives as we dig into topics such as boundaries, shame, blame, and resentment. Rumbling with these topics and moving from our first response to a deeper understanding about our thoughts, feelings, and behavior give birth to key learnings about who we are and how we engage with others. And for me, this is just understanding we need to take that step further. And so she asked these three questions to help us get us into the right frame of mind to begin evaluating these experiences. And so she, she frames it out this way, and I think this is a really good way to kind of approach these situa situations. Is What more do I need to learn and understand about the situation? So if I'm stepping into a situation um, that is not, and if I'm not in a good, good place, what do I need to further understand about this situation? Um, what do I need to learn and understand about the other people in the story? Sometimes when I'm entering into conflict, I can make up my own stories about everybody else that is a part of that story. So what, what else do I need to understand about the other people in that story? And the last question is, what more do I need to learn and understand about myself? So just like I said, we need to learn about ourselves a little bit more. What else do I need to learn about myself? Um, so I think she poses a couple of really good questions um, from that. And then um, the other book I'm going to recommend, I'll talk about these a little bit more later, but is Kill the Spider. And he really takes this journey of the struggles that I've been through and how can I begin evaluating these experiences. And he asks three fundamental questions after the first chapter that really helps us dive in a little bit deeper. He asks, what sort of behaviors do you exhibit in conflict? And what does that say about ourselves? What would your family say are things that you need to work on? Uh, I think that could be a very fun question to ask your family because uh, I think they can also see some of the blind spots around us that we may not be able to uh, understand ourselves. And the last question that he asks is, growing up, what are the things that you often got in trouble for? Because uh, sometimes we display behaviors uh, through our youth that we need to go back and say, okay, what about that? What does that say about who I am? And is there something there that I need to explore, explore a little bit more? Um, a couple other questions that, uh, some of the ones that I like to work through is, what are you being defensive about? And then take it that step further and say, okay, then why am I being defensive about that in the midst of this? What am I trying to self-protect against the person that I'm fighting with or that I'm in confrontation with? Um, one of the questions, and I, I brought my journal today, I'm not going to show you guys everything that's in it, but um, one of the questions that I write down a lot is, how is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? I think this is such a good open-ended question that you can take it to where you need to go um, the time uh, that you need to go there. Because uh, I, I feel like being able to ev evaluate yourself, how is it with my soul, can open a lot of questions. And uh, Brene Brown will talk about it, uh, doing this in a specific way. It's called your SFD. It's called your stormy first draft, where you begin writing. You, you begin free writing about what's going on in your mind. And you, you allow that inner teenager that's just bundled up and has a lot of emotions to express and you just let it all out. And you write like nobody else is going to read it. Because you're going to find some sort of theme or truth that's going to come out in the midst of that writing. And this isn't meant for anybody else, but you're gonna be able to see things about yourself that you may not have known that you were feeling or experiencing. And I think to dig down deep, these are some of the practices uh, that we need to be able to include. Um, a couple other resources that I think are super important when you begin examining yourself is we have the Wesley Accountability Questions. Uh, if you have that intentional discipleship what? book that we, uh, we handed out, I think last week and we did a seminar last year, there's a whole page of accountability questions. Um, and those questions are so revealing. Uh, one of my favorite ones is the very first one that he has on his list. And these questions aren't meant to be yes or no questions, and that's why I love them. Uh, the first one uh, simply states, am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I'm better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? That's, that's not a yes or no question. And if you can't wrestle with that for 10 minutes, I think you need to sit on that a little bit longer. Because uh, it really, for me, every time I ask myself the question is, okay, who am I portraying myself as? And what am I doing to self-protect so that other people see me the way that I want them to see me? 
Um, so for me, these are, these are really good questions to be able to sit and wrestle with a little bit more to kind of get behind the story uh, that we're telling ourselves. Um, so then the, the big question is now what? What do we do now? Uh, what does this actually look like? Uh, so I wanted to kind of share a little bit about my experience, about what I do, and, uh, and I'll do this uh, pretty quickly. Um, but when I realize that I'm becoming defensive, uh, the thing that I, I realize about myself that I'm telling myself is I begin to generalize. Uh, so if I get in a confrontation with my wife, I generalize a lot of things and I say, I always and I never. Or th- Butter's this, this bitter happens. if I put it in my batter. It will make my batter bitter. I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> I've been trying to ignore it this whole time, but that was really good. Okay, so when I'm in the midst of confrontation, I begin to generalize inside of my, my head. I use words like always and never. But then the second step of that is um, I usually start to make a comparison list. So if I'm in confrontation with my wife, I, say, I start to say, okay, well, I did this this morning and you didn't do any of that. So I took care of the kids. I got breakfast ready. I make this ongoing list inside of my head that I never communicate and I'm always in the right whenever I do that. So for me now, this inner dialogue has become a red flag to say, Dave, you're starting to, to teeter on the unhealthy side. What is good? going on, right? But then the second question is, sometimes it's easy to begin understanding these red flags, but where is that coming from? Where is that actually coming from? And, and for me, understanding myself, one of the things that I, that I do is I self-preserve, right? And so the story behind the story is, I, I'm really just trying to justify my worth in the midst of my family. I want, I want them to value me. I want them to know that I, I'm earning my keep, right? And that's, that, be, that begins with a small lie that we need to begin identifying, because the lie behind that is, I'm not good enough, is that I'll never, I'll never learn. Jesus. I'll, I'll, whoa. <laughs> Thanks, ben. I don't know if I can top that. Um, it, but, the, but the other side is that, that I'll never change. And so what are the lies that we're believing in that are, that are telling us the stories inside of our head that we need to begin changing that truth? And it all comes where we started, is being rooted in Christ, right? Understanding his promises and the truth that he's delivering to us, all right? So that, that's where I want to get you guys today, is just starting the conversation by saying, take the time, evaluate your experiences, and believe in the promises that God has for us and being rooted in Christ. So that's really what I want to land tonight. So what I want to do now is we have a panel discussion with about 15 minutes. I'm going to invite that panel to come up here now, if you're a part of that discussion. While they're coming up here, um, I want to explain these resources for you. Um, I have Killing the Spider in the back, and I have Rising Strong in the back. Um, I would love for you guys to take these resources, because they've helped me along in this journey to understand what stories I'm telling myself and how I'm dealing with them. But I have, I have three rules in the midst of taking these books, all right? So pay attention as I explain these three rules really, really fast. The first one is that um, if you take it, you must read it. Um, I think that's implied, but what I mean by that is I would love if you take a book, it, once you finish reading it, um, let me know. Because the question I want to ask is what did you learn about it? What did you learn about yourself? What did God reveal to you in Wait. the midst of this story? Uh, the second rule that I have is I wrote these all down. Um, Jesus is lo- I don't Sean? That's Sean. That's awesome. Um, the, uh, the second rule that I'm going to say um, is don't take it for somebody else. Um, don't try to fix somebody else with these books. These books are intended for you to understand your story a little bit more. Uh, so I'm just going to, I'm going to end there and then I'm going to hand it off to Steve. Sounds good. Sean or Steve, whichever is going to talk now. We'll see. <laughs> hey, um, we know that you, you've had lots of questions over the last uh, two, three weeks, I guess it is now. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of open it up uh, for open conversation. I brought uh, the Kids Point uh, microphone ball. And so here's how this works. Can you turn me on, Amber? Are we already on? Test, test, test. Test, test. test. Good to go? Can you guys hear me? Okay. So here's how it'll work. I will throw this. It's kind of a dodgeball. Don't hurt each other. Um, if you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand, and whoever has the ball will throw it to you when they're done with their question. Um, and so it'll be an opportunity for us to be able to speak into the mic but, and so everybody can hear it, but also play a fun game at the same time. So um, there are a few mics behind you guys you can grab. I will say this. Um, you're going to have to share a little bit. We also have a few new people on the panel that you haven't seen the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to give them an opportunity real quick. Those of you who know that you are new can take a moment to just introduce yourselves and then we'll get going with some questions. I'm Stacy Hansen. 
And um, you want me to tell a little bit about yeah, myself? That'd be great. Okay. Um, married to this guy for 26 long years. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> And we have two boys. Jacob is 23. He lives out in Portland. Um, and Riley is 21. And he's going to Indiana Westlands. No, I'm Randy. And uh, I just wanted to draw attention to these. If you take them home and you see something there that you want to learn more about, um, I guess we'll talk about that later, right? Sure. Okay. Can I'm Adam Weiss, I'm married to Catherine, and we have five children, and we've been married since 05, so what is that? 13, 13. <laughs> In the spot. My name is Ben Margison, I am the college pastor here at Grace Point, and I've been married one year, and my wife's in the back over there, um, so yeah. Very good. Okay. Um, if you guys, does anybody have a question right off the bat they'd like to start? No, but it's going to go really quick if you guys don't have any. All right. I, I could start with one. The first one I have um, is for any of you. And uh, it is basically goes along the same lines of what we talked about tonight as far as self care. Um, how have you kept yourself spiritually sharp as a parent and uh, Ben, maybe as, um, as a son or a brother? I don't know. Um, in yourself. Um, uh, or as a husband, I should say. And how have you kept your own identity in the midst of parenting? I'll go. Um, years ago, I remember Pastor Steve Norby in one sermon saying, um, this was when we, I think we probably had three children at that time, and saying that um, your quiet time is going to look a lot different, especially when you're a parent, and it might not be that quiet time right away in the morning. It might not be a uh, set quiet time at 1 o'clock in the afternoon nor at 9 o'clock at night, and it just might be sporadic times throughout the day. And I've found that that has held true, especially with each addition of a child, that I don't necessarily have a designated quiet time during my day. But this is... <laughs> But it does happen, but it might be while I'm uh, running the vacuum cleaner or while I'm doing dishes or while I'm changing a diaper. Um, and just to keep that in mind, that it, but those pockets of time for myself just as a refreshment for my soul. And so that's something that I have used um, to uh, self-care uh, as far as um, studying the Bible and prayer time. That's good. That's good. I'll do a quick one. I think as your kids grow up, you go through different seasons and your identity changes because you're, you're a husband right now. I've never been a husband, just a husband, but, but you don't have children. Then you're a new parent, and that's an identity. I mean, your identity just changes, and so you have to figure out what that is and how you get fed to be the best at, at that at that point. And then pretty soon you've got teenagers, and that's a whole new game. And then pretty soon you're empty nesters, and then... Now my identity, I got to deal with that, and there's a that, and then now I'm a grandma. Well, what does that look like? Of course, I'm not old enough to be a grandma, but I am. So what do I do with that? And so I think your identity, you have got to make those shifts, and it never stays. You never can. It's just like being a Christian or being anything. You never stay in one spot. You're, it's always moving, and you've got to always be working at it. I like how you, ma'am, mentioned staying spiritually sharp. Uh, it kind of made me think of, of a few things, and Steve, you had listed them in the recovery steps here too, even like just developing a circle of support, right? And that makes me think of a uh, men's group that, I, that I'm involved with. There's eight to 10, sometimes 15 of us, right? And, and we talk a lot about iron sharpens iron. And when I think about staying spiritually sharp, right, that, that group comes to mind. And with iron sharpens iron comes friction too, right? It's not mm -hmm. like we've got men who are calling men out on things, right? It's, it's a good, tough conversations and uh, keeping each other, other sharp is a good way to put it. Uh, the mentorship thing, like I mentioned last week, has uh, definitely been valuable for me. And my mornings have been having to start at like 4.50 a.m., right, for, my, uh, for me to get my time alone. Um, so, but we got to figure out what works, right? And for me, it's getting up early. I like that time. I like sitting by the fireplace, cup of coffee, reading and learning. And so... Just got to figure out what works for you. But I, I do like the suggestion of just really developing a circle of support and uh, 
figure out who that is and get involved and make sure that you've got people in your life who are kind of sharpening you too. I think a, a huge thing, this is mostly coming from observing my own dad, is consistency. Uh, every single night, I would see him now with his readers, but he didn't used to need them. Um, I, I see him every single night before he goes to bed with his Bible reading. Um, and every single Sunday we went to church. Uh, and I know it's like, oh, you just do your things and you're a Christian and you're good. It's not about that. It's There's a consistency with spending time with God and having, like, as a parent, your kids see that consistency. And um, it doesn't go unnoticed, so. Any other questions? I just have a quick comment. <clears throat> you know, you hear us up here say, and I really go, I resonate with what John said about finding a group. But I, there's many times when I wanted that group, but I didn't know how to find that group. And I don't have the answer for that, but you just have to keep looking for those people. You have to keep reaching out, and you have to keep saying, will you be this for me? And, and if you don't find it with that first person, just keep, keep seeking and keep praying about that. I had a a season in my life just a couple of years ago, and I was just desperate for a really deep friendship, someone that would hold me accountable to a deeper level of spirituality and not just say, it's okay, you're just, you know, sometimes we give each other excuses, and I didn't want someone to give me excuses, but to find that group. And so just keep persisting and keep pressing into places where you think women or men like that might be. everything with that or I really want to see you throw that ball I'm excited, excited to throw it like I want somebody to raise their hands like so I can throw it to them <laughs> all right uh, I'm coming closer well, that's to a say. Part toss. <laughs> <laughs> I can only see half the panel so <laughs> uh, my question is I think it's a simple question, but yet it's a difficult answer. Um, I know there's a basic, generic answer to it, but it's just as a husband and a father of balancing um, work stress, family things going on, your own individual quiet time, when work stress is really, really just kind of getting at you and stuff, how do you keep that separate from your trying to enjoy your family time and the time at home and not let that, oh, excuse me, get into that? And like I said, if there's a very simple answer that I heard a hundred or a thousand times, but when that stuff is just, you can't let it go. You can't just get away from it. How do people up there on the panel help deal with that? I don't need that. I think I might. Um, whoa. I guess that's the answer. Steve is speaking. <laughs> wow. um, very real question, Chris. I, I know that, like working at 3M, for instance, and being hardcore in that area, you just you have a tendency to take it home and just dwell on it. And a couple things I learned. One is, I, you should read that book, Cheating. Okay, you cheat on something always in your life, so you have to have a quitting time. You have to leave it. I know that's a simple answer, but it isn't. You have to say 5:30. I've given this organization a good day's work. They paid me for it. That's my obligation, and that's her obligation to me. They, you don't owe more. I know when you're in a business with a family, it's a little different, you know. Then you go home and you're present. You know, if you, it helps to have a little drive time to, to detune, but you don't have that in the small towns. But when you go home, you're present, and you love your wife, and you love your children. But you're present, and you give them your, your attention, and you make them the priority, and you forget about work. you got to do it. It's discipline. I wish I could say it's just easy and you just, you know, it's natural. It's not. For, for a lot of men, you just, you're living and breathing. I have the phone calls all the time at home, you know, maintenance department, right? It never stops. But I think, you know, there was a rhythm that, and I, I begin to feel less and less guilty. Though, and being a pastor is even worse because you're doing kingdom of God work. So, you know, you have a tendency to shelf your family. And uh, so I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, but... A little bit, right? I should probably say something since I skipped out in one of the other weeks, but um, it kind of resonates with me too. We farm, and so we have 
some exceptionally long hours and it's it's hard to get a sacrifice but even just like when there's kids the activities and stuff if you can leave for an hour or two and then come back um, that's what I try to do because it is hard to just let it go you know but that may not be the answer you're looking for but that's what how I try to deal with that some Chris I can't see you but I know your beautiful voice <laughs> Uh, recently, I, I read a book on the importance of play, both for, for kids and for adults, just to find time to actually play and have fun, and uh, kind of resonated with me a little bit, and took that home and, and even thought about, like, what does, like, if I were to talk about play for me, what is that, right? For me as an adult, do I even have time where, where I enjoy and just do something fun that I'm not having to think about, taking care of the kids or doing this for work, and, like, what is play? Right, and then, then look for an opportunity to do that. And I thought about back in my childhood, I loved Legos. Like I played Legos for hours, right? And I still have all my old Legos at home. So one night I got home and I said, I'm gonna get out the Legos. And I sat there and I got down and I played and kids joined, right? And we got on the floor, we played Legos for hours. And I went and we just had an absolute blast. And it was all just about play, right? There was no work, there was no obligations, there was nothing else to think about. It was just having plain old fun. And we got to do it together, and it was, uh, it was good for me. I think it was good for them, and it was good for our relationship. So. Is this working? I've got the opposite thing. Like, my husband's working 12 to 14-hour days at the post office, and he can't tell them I'm done at 530. They're like, no, we have mail, and it has to get out. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to answer something on him. I know that when your son has you pick him up from preschool, and gets to ride in, what is it, I don't know, like your awesome tractor, motor, whatever it is. He is excited, so make the most of those opportunities because that's special. And my kids, they hardly see their dad right now, but when they do, and we go out for a drive to see the lights and stay up a little too late last night, you know, making the most of those opportunities. But it's also hard for me because my husband's so down and he doesn't know when it's going to stop. They keep losing employees at the post office and everybody keeps ordering from Amazon. <laughs> but it's, it's so hard, but I try to be intentional with my words for my husband. Like, you're doing such a good thing. Thank you, thank you that you're working so hard. And even though you feel like your kids never see you and they're upset or disappointed, when they do see you, they're so excited and they're so happy and they know that you love them. So I guess what would be some of those other tips for um, people whose spouse, they can't, they can't get out of their work. They're doing what they've got to do. And I saw in here that they can't just quit. Well, that's too bad because that would help. What are some of your tips for like us, like for me, for my husband? How do we encourage them? How do we keep them up when they're really down? Well, I'm married to a farmer, and so I completely understand the seasons of the life. Um, and uh, for a while, I'll be quite honest with you guys, the first few years of our marriage, or particularly after we had children, um, I grew up on a farm, so I'm supposed to understand all this, right? But after we had children, it became a different ball game, and I know I would make it difficult for Adam at times because I, you know, wanted him there and wanted him more present, but it came down to what was going on in Catherine's heart, and God did a work within me, and um, I had to um, just change my perspective. And when my perspective changed, my whole being changed as well. And to be accepting of this is what God has called him to do. And he's not putting in those late hours because he doesn't want to be with his family. Of course not. He's doing that because he loves us. And he wants to provide, and that's what God has designed these guys to be, is to be um, not only our helper, but our provider. And once I recognized that and was brutally honest with myself, I, I, th I think I became a little bit more um, easier to live with. One time when we were going through a really hard time, um, and I wasn't raised on a farm, but I married a farmer who's... Um, he's not here, so he'll, there'll probably never be another woman, but there'll be another cattle sale. 
So he's at the cattle sale all the time. But I was going through a really low point, and my dad said something to me, and he, it really made me mad because I was feeling justified in my righteous anger. And, um, he said, your job is to love your husband and then to just carve out those times when you know that, that he's present. And that was hard for me, but I also had some women in my life that were role models, and I never heard them say negative things about their husbands, and I didn't know how they did that because I had a whole nag list, and I, I still kind of do sometimes. But to really practice not saying negative things about his job or negative things about how I wish you were here because that just makes him feel like a louse. And, and men don't need that. They need us to just love them. Hello? Um, at what point is it selfishness versus self-care for you as an individual? I guess uh, in my Christian walk, one of the hardest things that I talk to my Sunday school class about this is finding balance. Balance in so many areas of life. And one of them is that, you know, if you're at the gym seven days a week, two hours a day, and uh, that's the only free time that you have for your family or something like that, and you're then saying, oh, this is self-care, uh, I think you've lost balance. And so finding that balance is a tricky, tricky thing. But I think um, what's nice about it is Christianity isn't about a bunch of rules, and, and uh, there's a a living God through the Holy Spirit that will guide you if you seek him. And, and uh, you've got a great spouse that's going to guide you too if you seek them. <laughs> and so looking at, am I keeping balance? Asking those questions from your accountability partner, from your spouse, and then uh, through the Holy Spirit, um, finding that, that balance, that's key. Mm -hmm. Not easy. Okay, sorry. I told John I could answer this question too, but I thought I'll just wait, and then John said, go ahead. Um, I like to exercise, and I like that time in my day, my morning starts best if I do my workout before kiddos get up. But there was also a point, I'm gonna get, be brutally honest, that if I did not get that in, um, it just kind of controlled my day, and I knew something was out of whack there. And so just in the last few years, um, it's, a, it's still a priority, but it is okay, and I, it, I'm okay with it if I miss a day here or there. But I knew when my everything kind of lost perspective, I knew something was wrong there within my heart. So just being aware of what's going on within your heart, too. Uh, I just have a, a couple things I want to share, and then um, I'm going to spend a moment together uh, with a commissioning prayer to kind of, together as we leave this place, one, to, to hold one another accountable, but also to continue this together and to um, press into what God might have for each one of us. And so just a couple of housekeeping things. Number one, um, just a reminder, there's some resources back on the table. Uh, we've got more Bibles if you would like one. That's one of the greatest gifts that you can give a child. If you've got a child in your life that you would like to give one to, or if you want one for yourself, there's also some other resources back there. And if we're out of anything, um, feel free to sign up on the clipboard um, before you leave as well. We can get you the resources that you need. The second thing is, I think um, Amber's going to put on the board, uh, yep, on the screen, I mean, um, we really appreciate your feedback. We'd love to have uh, your thoughts and um, your, your ideas, questions, things you might have about the seminars that we've done because we want to continue the, the, this type of learning together. 
Um, and so we would appreciate if you would uh, just take a few moments uh, to fill that out. Um, if you don't want to write it down, just take a picture of that real quick and hit it up later tonight if you've got time as well. Um, and then last thing I want to do just real quick is one of the things that we, uh, we love about this opportunity is there's always an opportunity for next steps. Maybe the conversation has started for you. Maybe it's continued. Um, but what we want to do is, is introduce you to an opportunity to be able to continue the conversation, continue in learning. And so if you open up this book, uh, it says Groups on the Front, Winter 2019. Uh, there's a couple on each table. I think it's the third or fourth page. Um, you'll see a couple of groups that... Um, will specifically be centered around family. One um, is the crazy cycle and, and future family, and that is taught by Mike and Christy Van Hofwagen. I think Mike is here, uh, and Christy both. If you guys want to stand up or wave, uh, just to kind of put a face with the names, if you don't already know them, Christy's real thrilled I made her stand up. I, I'm so sorry about that. Um, and then the other one that's going to be offered is uh, The Art of Marriage. It's a marriage uh, course, and it's by the Weeses and the Gerlachs, and I think, I, I know the Weeses are here. The Gerlachs here too? Did I see them in here? Maybe not. Um, but uh, you saw Adam and Catherine up here on the platform as well. If you would like to, to, um, to be part of either of these groups, uh, we have a, a, a computer back here. And on this wall back here, we encourage you to stop by one of those terminals before you leave and just sign up for one of those. Also, um, Randy and Stacy Hansen in the spring will be teaching another class on family and parenting as well. We don't have the literature for that yet, but that will be another opportunity. Um, we don't encourage you to wait for that one. If you want to take both, do so. Um, if, you, if you've got the time available here in the fall, or excuse me, in the spring, then sign up for that one. Um, but a lot of opportunities as we move forward to do so, and we encourage you to be part of those things and those different classes as we move forward. Let me pray for you, and then um, if you've got any other thoughts, any other questions, maybe you didn't, uh, you weren't brave enough to answer or ask, or maybe you weren't framed all the way. Uh, I'll be around. Pastor Steve's going to stick around. Pastor Dave and some of the others as well. Uh, you can ask us those things. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. I thank you for uh, the the family members here, the parents, the future parents, the the, the aunts, the uncles, the, the grandparents, the friends, whoever it might be in this room right now. I thank you for their uh, the, the 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 fact that they have stepped into this room tonight, or maybe over the course of the last two or three weeks, to say yes, I want to be intentional. Yes, I want to know how to steward well. Yes, I want to be able to pour into the lives of the people, the children that God has placed before me within my home or in the homes of someone that I love. And God, tonight we ask, Father, for your guiding hand. We ask, Father, for your guiding light and, and for your wisdom as we, as we move forward, God, to know what to say, when to say it, when to listen, when to be quiet. God, when to take action. God, how to discipline all the different things that are encapsulated in this idea of parenting and this idea of, of shepherding. God, I pray, Father, for, for your guiding light and for us to be open and to listen. And as we look at this concept, even of prayer, as, as I heard Pastor Aaron talk about this morning, and Steve reiterate as well, Father, the fact that when we do pray, it changes something in us so that we, uh, so that we operate differently, God. It's not about, Father, us praying and then you taking care of our list, Father, but it's about us being changed and formed through the concept of prayer so that we can step forward. <laughs> to fulfill your will. And I pray, God, that that would happen. I pray, Father, as we commission here tonight, that we would go send people, send parents, send family members, send friends, ready to step into this world intentionally and on purpose to change the lives and to form the lives of the young, of the people within our care. God, as we, as we sit here in this room right now and, and, and the, the funny uh, voices come over the microphone from the youth ministry and we hear the kids running upstairs, that is what it's about. And it brings joy to my heart and, and, and joy to the, to, the, to the atmosphere here tonight to, to hear the presence of children in this building and hear, Father, the fact that, that they are here in these moments. And at the conclusion of this time, we're going to go and we're going to pick them up and we're going to take them home and we're going to engage with them as well. And God, I pray that you would guide our steps. I pray that you would be present in our homes. I pray, Father, that you'd be present in, in, in every aspect of our lives. When, we, when we're in the car, when we're, when we're out, when we're, when we're eating dinner, God, that you would direct our paths. Father, we thank you. We love you. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be intentional families. We love you, God. We place it all before you. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.